Greetings, folks. I'm Tim Mendes, and welcome to a very special author showcase for Death Cuisine. Now, as you will have already seen the live launch party, I thought it'd be nice to include the other authors in some way, shape or form. So in this upcoming video, we've got some interviews with people. Uh, we've got a, um, a special video clip that was sent to me. And we've also got myself representing a couple of the authors who couldn't make it. Uh, so sit back, relax, uh, and enjoy the next hour or so of, well, ghastly entertainment. Right, yes, and for my first guest, uh, we're going to go to Banbury in Oxfordshire. I'm um, bringing you Elizabeth Nettleton. Elizabeth, thank you for coming Hi. on. Hi. Thank you for oh, having me. Yeah, not, a, not at all. It was a pleasure. Uh, your story was absolutely brilliant. Uh, in that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I, I really, I, one of the things I liked about this was how different everybody's piece was. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I had a few come in and they were, they were different. And then yours come in and it was different again. And it was just like, <laughs> oh, this is great. This is great. You know, you don't want every story to be on the same sort of beats, do you? No, yeah. no, definitely not. You want lots of variety, lots of flavour, if you will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ooh, I like it. I like it. Yeah, so um, so you're originally from Australia. Uh, yes, that's right. Um, from the Sunshine Coast, which is um, southeast Queensland. Yeah, Queensland. Yeah. yeah. Nice. So how long, so you, you told me earlier you, you were living in the US and you've been over here. Yeah, so I we've kind of jumped around a lot. So I um, started off in Australia, then came to England um, mm -hmm. for an exchange year, um, right. had so much fun that I decided not to go back home. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, so stayed in England for a little bit. Um, yeah. And then my husband and I got an opportunity to go to Germany. And then after nice. that, go to the US and then oh, we came back. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Absolutely. it's been really, really fun, but um, yeah. So we sort of settled back here now. Right. Is this where you're staying now or? You're going yeah. to get itchy feet again at some point. <laughs> We're hoping not because now we actually have a lot of stuff. <laughs> this is exactly for me. I mean, I've moved around a hell of a lot. Like, uh, there's not yeah. many, but few, many places in Britain I haven't lived. And uh, I've, I've jumped around because I was a chef as well. So it was just easy for me. Okay, just to yeah. go. I've had enough. I'll just get a job somewhere else and just go there. And, mm -hmm. and uh, it's got to the point now where my record collection is far too vast to move again. <laughs> it's yeah. just like I'm, I'm done with it. <laughs> my, my husband and I, we started off with only enough possessions to fit in yeah. two suitcases to get on mm. a plane. And then now we've Yeah, got, that's like me. Yeah, I had to hold all of the rucksack. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the amount of stuff we have. <laughs> Incredible how much you accumulate, isn't it? Just... I know. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of books. I've got to admit, a lot of that are yeah. my books. Yeah, but a lot of my, I love, well, we've both got a book issue. We yeah. both, we've both got I book like that problem. book issue. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like we've both got, uh, we've both got to be red piles that you can go mountaineering on. Is there? So many. <laughs> and I'm the kind of person as well, like I like to, I'll buy an ebook first. Mm -hmm. And then if I like it enough, I'll buy the paperback version to, to reread or to just put on my shelf or something. I do that but as the well. problem is, yeah. I just like so many books. <laughs> that they're yeah. taking over like this is the book's house now we're just nice. we're just here <laughs> hoping it doesn't charge us rent soon <laughs> excellent it's a little library <laughs> yeah that's my that's goal a, that's my goal as well it's not like my dream is to have this i have a little room that i can turn into a library you know yeah, I, want, that's I, want, the dream. I want the music room as well for all my records oh yeah <laughs> it's just it's like I saw I saw pictures of John Peel's house after he died, and I was just like, uh -huh. "Oh my God, that's my idea of heaven!" Yeah, <laughs> I know. Like I... Walls full of them. <laughs> just goals, absolute yeah. goals. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, death cuisine. So, what was your initial when I first contacted you about it? Uh, what were your first yeah. thoughts? So, my first thoughts were that this seemed like such a cool, fun concept. Yeah. Um, the only challenge I was going to have was to come up with something that one I could make 
and yep. two, so that would taste good because yeah, those yes, two things yeah, yeah. do not often meet me in the kitchen. Uh, <laughs> so are you the cook in the house then? Well, unfortunately I am. Um, <laughs> you don't sound I full of confidence. <laughs> no, we, we eat a lot of simple stuff. Yeah. But, um, so yeah, so that's sort of what got me brainstorming that the... the the food was the first thing that I thought of because of that. I was like, I need to think of something first. I need, yeah, I need no, my food I was, first. I was going to ask what came first, the recipe or the story. Yeah. yeah. So because of my lack of culinary prowess, um, <laughs> I decided to go with the food first. And nice. I thought, nice. you know, because I'm Australian, it might be fun to do something Australian flavoured. Yeah. And... Um, Almost immediately, I thought of the lamington because it's just delicious. Yes, and yeah, then and it is a very, very sort of quintessentially Australian dish as well. It is like every yeah. birthday party, every other possible occasion you could think of mm. will have lamington. <laughs> nice <Yep. laughs> school yep. parties, home parties, and then um, and I was kind of thinking about it because fairy bread is also another huge. Yes hugely popular dish um <laughs> ish dish ish um and i thought <laughs> I like dish ish yeah i like it yeah. and i knew that people had put them together before so it was uh -huh. kind of just that light bulb moment of, i'm gonna try this and i'm gonna make it work because that sounds amazing and it yes. was and it was almost like as soon as i thought of fairy bread lamingtons the character of maddie sort of popped into my head nice and yeah. of course fairies popped into my head yeah yes yeah yeah yeah, yeah. but not and any it was just fairies kind of, no i was just kind of like murderous i need to have fairies <laughs> but make them evil yeah, murderous fairies. <laughs> yeah. exactly i was like fairies <laughs> that are not going to make anyone's life good <laughs> <laughs> at all <laughs> no. yeah i love the concept so uh, i i thought it was, it was it was great and again it's like the how different the stories are the, the recipes are as well we've got proper mm. global cuisine going on here in this yeah. <laughs> it's all over everywhere and like that mix of savory and the desserts yes. and all sorts of things I was yeah, looking well, that I'm was something like... that uh, i thought i was because i wanted to do that to begin i wanted stuff that uh, sweet and savory and i wanted a, a yeah. mix of vegetarian stuff as well and i thought i may have to sort of say can you mm -hmm. do a dessert or could you know we've got enough of these now can you do something like yeah. that but i didn't it, it all balanced out without any input from me just with what That's people said yeah it's, it's great because i thought it was going to be trickier than it actually was uh yeah because yeah, it, it, it's um yeah when people came to me and said what they wanted to do i was just like oh that's great because so we've got we've got vegan we've got vegetarian we've got yeah, yeah we've got a great mixture of stuff and uh yeah i'm, I'm really, really really lucky how it worked out because the last <laughs> thing you want is sort of like 18 meat pie recipes or something oh <laughs> for like, sure yeah uh, i mean because that could yeah. so easily happen um, oh absolutely just people go oh i could do spaghetti bolognese i'll do spaghetti bolognese too <laughs> you yeah. know before you know it you know so <laughs> it could easily no, happen that, that was something that i definitely was really impressed with when i was looking through it i was like these are all yeah. so different they're so you know this like you said savory sweet meat vegetarian vegan just yeah. such like it, it looked like a proper menu yeah it does it really it? cool I, I was impressed I'm, I'm really happy with it i'm really pleased with that it's like, come on. yeah and like again, it's uh, the, the, one of the reasons that the people I chose were the people I chose is because I like their stuff and how they work, and I and I also know that they're all different. Oh yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's like everybody's got a different style and things like that. And, yeah, which that's is really what cool. Yeah, yeah, and it's, it's, what, it's and what you it, need, isn't it? It's because uh, you like yeah. say if you you have a an anth it's the same thing as like a menu, isn't it? You have an anthology. And every story is a shark or something mm. you're gonna get bored aren't you so exactly yeah you, you know you need these different we got all sorts in there <laughs> we got yeah. all sorts of yeah <laughs> and it, i just i love that it happened also naturally as well like you yes. said 
the, yeah. the, you know, the people that you chose are so different. And so it was able mm. to happen in a really natural way. Um, and you could kind of just release us. Into yeah. <laughs> well, that's what I liked. That I, it was and... so really painless for me. I mean, I mean, there were there were some hiccups along the way, but that was just like that was more back and back behind the scenes kind of stuff, like uh, movie right. publisher and and just and just time and things like that. But that that wasn't you guys. I just let you guys do it. <laughs> <laughs> It was like go write things <laughs> so that was great for me so like, you know because oh, the, the last thing you want to do when you've got one of these projects is to, is to have it have a problem within the group and there was none of that and, uh, oh good yeah yeah so no, it was, was really so much fun so much yeah. fun so, yeah it was, it was a good crowd it was a good laugh so uh, yeah yes. i'm really pleased i'm glad really you was. enjoyed it as well because uh you know <laughs> it's half the battle isn't it if you're enjoying something yeah, oh. and I mean, I think you can tell as well when you're reading through the stories, we were having fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> I definitely think so, yeah. <laughs> right, excellent. Yeah, so uh, are you going to give us a little bit of a, an excerpt of your story then? Yes, so this is yes. an excerpt from Inside the Doll House. Excellent. I will just uh, put you on speaker, so leave the camera to you. Just give me a wave when you're done. Okay, sure. Maddie, Maddie, get up quick. Maddie cracked an eye open. The first rays of morning sunlight filtered through his curtains, painting rainbows across his wall. He smiled, then turned over. A pair of brown eyes hovered inches away from his face. The lamington is gone, Polly squealed. What? Maddie gasped, his heart hammering in his chest. The lamington is gone. Maddie went to rub his eyes, but Polly grabbed his arm and pulled him towards a window instead. She pointed at the dollhouse in the garden. See, the plate is still there, but the lamington is gone. The fairies ate it. Maddie forced himself to smile. That's awesome, Poll. I'm glad the, the fairies liked them. Let's make some more. Oh, Polly, Maddie's heart sank. We used up all the ingredients yesterday. They left us some more. What? Yeah, I found them sitting by the back door. What are you talking about? Come look. She pushed Maddie out of the room and ushered him towards the back door. Maddie shook his head, then started to laugh, certain she was playing a joke on him. With one last grin in his direction, Polly wrenched the door open and pointed at the doormat. Sitting on large green leaves that didn't match any of the trees in their small yard were six eggs, a slab of butter, a dollop of cream, piles of flour, sugar, and corn flour, and at the very back, a handful of hundreds and thousands. Maddie glanced at the window above them. Was this their mother's way of saying sorry? It seemed unlikely, but he supposed it wasn't impossible. Their dad? His father wasn't home when Maddie went to bed last night, and if Maddie were to guess, he was probably still out. I have deadlines to meet, son. He imagined his father saying when he eventually returned. I stayed in the travel lodge to save some time. It was a line that was all too familiar now. Maddie was old enough to assume, as he knew his mother did, that deadlines was codenamed for Madison, his dad's receptionist. The family had met her a few times and Maddie had picked up on a vibe. He couldn't put into words what that vibe was or why he'd felt it, but it had been right before. No, it must have been their mother. She'd probably stumbled downstairs in the early hours of the morning, searching for a way to numb the guilt before she reached for another bottle of Merlot. Can we make some now before school? Polly asked eagerly, pulling Maddie from his thoughts. Huh? Some fairy bread lamingtons. Can we make some now? Oh, right. Um, sure, I guess. It's early enough, he said with a wry grin. They picked up the leaves, been as careful as they could to avoid spilling anything, and carried them into the kitchen. The next hour was spent mixing, baking, and decorating, until they had six fresh lamingtons lined up in front of them. We'll save some for the fairies though, won't we? Polly asked as she took a bite of her treat. Of course, Paul. They gave us the ingredients after all. Maddie picked up a pencil and some paper. Thanks, Mum. Hope you like it, he scribbled before sticking the note next to one of the lamingtons. He took two for his and Polly's lunchboxes, then placed the rest on a clean plate and carried them outside to the dollhouse. 
Perfect, Polly said with a smile. It looks good, Polly, Maddie said. He squinted at his glowing Spider-Man watch. But we'd better get ready for school. It's getting late. Ten minutes later, they were back at the door, their bags over their shoulders and the front door key in Maddie's pocket. He didn't like taking the key, not without telling their mother first, but he couldn't leave her alone in an unlocked house. She wouldn't need it, he tried to reassure himself. She never went anywhere. Maddie glanced in the direction of her bedroom again. If he was honest with himself, he doubted she'd even notice they were gone. Excellent, excellent. Thank you. Uh, yeah, excellent, well done. That was really good, yeah. Thank you. Brilliant, yeah. No, well done, you did a really good job on that, yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you can breathe now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> get the water. Yeah, <laughs> it's surprisingly nerve-wracking, isn't it? <laughs> it really is, it really is. Yeah, it's, uh, you have, so this is your first time doing this, isn't it? First time doing a reading. Yeah. Oh, you <laughs> nailed it. You nailed it. Yeah. Oh, thank right. you. That was good. Yeah. I mean, it was really fun. Good. Just, <laughs> it does get a bit nerve wracking. <laughs> it does. <laughs> well, that's what I was like, what do you think I always drink before I do them? <laughs> Dutch courage, isn't it? <laughs> is the, yeah, exactly. A few down the neck first. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Right, yeah, thank you for doing that. So, uh, thank you so much. Go, what are you working on at the moment? Anything you can talk about, or are you all small? Yeah, so I'm just finishing up the second book in um, a middle grade fantasy series that I'm doing, and it should be out nice. really, really soon. So, oh, just excellent. kind of doing the last sort of bits of editing now and getting it all ready. So, yeah, that's Brilliant. really quite exciting. Excellent, <laughs> excellent, excellent. Yeah, nice one. Yeah, so uh, good luck with that. And, uh, and thank so you for much. coming on. And uh, yep. Yeah. So thank you, for, thank you for coming on. And uh, yeah, well, let's move on. Yep. <laughs> and, uh... <laughs> yeah. So from Oxfordshire, we head north, way north, and across the border into Scotland for our next guest, who is S. O. Green. Uh, now they couldn't be with us today, uh, so. I sent them uh, a questionnaire and they were good enough to fill it out and uh, I will read an excerpt for them. So let's go ahead and do this. It may come across as a bit weird, but just go with it. I'm sure it will be fine. <laughs> uh, they've written the answers in the first person. Uh, so I'm going to go with that. And because I think, you know, you'll get the flavor of the of, of the writer from that. Uh, so I'll go with what's on the thing. If it comes across as weird, then hey, run with it. Right. Yeah, my first question was, first, tell me a little bit about yourself. Who are you? Where are you from? How long have you been writing? Etc. And the reply was, hey, folks, sorry for not being able to make it tonight. I am Simone Green and I write as S.O. Green. I'm the author of Sin Chaser, part of the post-apocalyptic series of novelettes published by Erie River Publishing. I'm also Erie River's chief contract editor and the judge of its monthly contest. I have around 70 short stories published with imprints like Black Ink, Dragon Soul, and of course, Breaking Rules Europe. Uh, I live in the kingdom of Fife and I've been writing since I was in single digits, but I admittedly wasn't very good at it back then. I don't know, I, I think some, some of my best stuff was probably written in crayon. <laughs> right, the second question I asked, when I first approached you about the project, what were your thoughts? And the answer is, is this going to be another tentacle story? <laughs> Case of fair cop. Uh, no, I was flattered and excited. I like a little food porn in my stories and I wanted to try writing a food horror story that didn't involve a meat product, as many of them do. Plus, I got to push my vegan agenda. Now, that's a very good point because um, I wanted to have a wide range of not just recipes but types of recipes so i wanted some vegetarian i wanted some vegan and obviously i'm i'm a rampant carnivore so there's going to be meat in there one way or the other um <clears throat> i'm also a fan of of um simone's work so it was a no-brainer for me knowing that they were vegan so it was a case of right doing it you know so yeah okay the third question was 
what came for first story or recipe? And the answer was actually it was one ingredient, seaweed. Once I've decided on a key ingredient to factor into both the recipe and story, both the story and dish chose themselves. Awesome. That's kind of what happened with mine as well. My, I, I knew that it had to involve mushrooms. Uh, being as it was set in Cornwall, no brainer really, Cornish pasty. You know, it's got, it's got to be a type of pasty, hasn't it? <laughs> okay, the next question was, do you cook? If so, what is your favourite type of thing to cook? If not, who does the cooking? Or are you an eat out or take away kind of person? And the answer is, I definitely cook. Admittedly, it's mostly to recipes because I'm not very adventurous, but I don't get any complaints. One thing I've learned, cooking good plant-based food can be tough. I agree, it can. It can. You can very easily cock it up. It's pretty rewarding, though. I try to avoid eating out because then I can, can't control what's in my food. So from scratch is the way to go. That's, that's yeah. Uh, I have allergies um, to food colourings and things like that. So that limits my eating out things as well. I, I steer clear of, you know, certain places and things like that for that very same reason. I don't want to go into anaphylactic shock on a night out. It's not fun. OK, the next question was, how hard did you find the concept? Did it just flow from the pen or were you racking your brains trying to come up with a dish to work a story around? And the answer was, everything pretty much wrote itself for this project. I knew I wanted to write Eldritch Horror because this was a Tim Mendes led project and it just seemed appropriate. Again, it's a fair cop. And once I settled on seaweed as my focus, it took off from there. The story itself ended up being pretty sad, but I think a good horror story should be transgressive and leave you with that feeling. It's a very good point. So the next question I asked, why did you choose your particular dish? And the answer was, because it's super easy to make. <laughs> At least you're honest. Uh, it also set me up with writing and characters because I knew I wanted something in the States, but on the West Coast rather than Lovecraft's traditional East Coast, with a Japanese character called Tomoe, or Tom for short. The ingredients for the story were all there, same as they were for the recipe. OK, and finally I asked, what are you working on right now? The answer was, I'm working on group projects like this one right now. I've had the fortune to be invited to a lot of really cool author-led anthologies, including another by Tim, that I think a lot of people are going to enjoy. Matron! Other than that, I'm editing anthologies for Black Ink Fiction and Eerie River over the next month or two, and hopefully preparing for the Sin Chaser sequel. Thanks, Tim, for inviting me to this amazing project, and I hope everyone enjoys their evening and enjoys the book. Yes, excellent, and uh, thank you for taking part. I'm going to have to shut the curtains. That's... <laughs> Before I read the excerpt, I'm going to shut the curtains. There we go. Now I won't burst into flames. Uh... <laughs> I don't know where that even came from. Right. OK, so now I'm going to read um, Simone's excerpt of her story from Death Cuisine called Scattered. The owner, a stout gruff looking guy with a hairline retreating into the hinterlands of his scalp, grey as steel and with eyes to match. Looked like he was shutting up the place when they shuffled up to the open door. Nina half expected him to push the door shut. Instead, he lay out two menus and beckoned them in. She felt a clench in her stomach whenever they walked into a new place, especially an old, small place. South, around Calliway, they hadn't raised too many eyebrows. Two girls travelling alone, holding hands all the time, was the least of strange sights along a coast littered with washed up Hollywood debris. If it came to it, they'd say sisters. Most people took that at face value, even though Nina was short and heavy and had inherited red hair from some distantly Celtic ancestor that predated the dull brunettes who birthed her. And Tom was Japanese. Dark of hair and eye and complexion. Prejudice was like being blind in one eye. He didn't say anything, just let them sit at the table and make eyes at each other over the faded, folded cardboard while he wiped down the colourful formica around them. They sat side by side, double dating with their battered old rucksacks. No tamales, Nina pointed out. We might be too far north, 
Well, there are plenty of Japanese dishes on the menu, and that's always a nice surprise. Teriyaki noodles, miso shiru, chirashi sushi. Chirashi? Scattered. It's a little different from your California rolls. I'm into different. Hope you're into seaweed too, the owner said, swinging back around. Customary to put a little extra on the dishes we make here. I don't mind a little salt, Nina said, smirk pulling up like an arrow in Tom's direction. Her girlfriend just frowned at her. It's not really about the sodium. Folks like to feel the connection to the sea. Reminds us of what's important, what brings us life. Where do you import it from? Tom asked. She had her phone resting under her hand, ready to type, always looking for colour for the channel. No imports. It's grown locally. We've got a kelp field along the coast. We tend and harvest it, serve it up here. Most folk eat at least one meal a day here. Oh, really? Do you mind if I ask where the field is? Maybe we could take a look tomorrow morning. It would go perfectly in the video. It'd be a crowd pleaser. Homegrown organic ingredients sourced locally. And it formed a great narrative. Nina always liked the idea that their channel could help small places find a wider audience they deserved. The town had enough houses, but it was quiet, out of the way. Like technology didn't or wouldn't touch it. Tourism, probably a non-entity. Maybe they could change that. Or maybe she was dreaming. Head in the cloud right along with Tom's pro-edited video packages and their climbing subscriber count. Their channel probably couldn't change the world, but it could change a few lives. That could happen, right? Can you bring us two bowls? Tom asked. And Nina could see the wheels turning behind her deep, dark eyes. The next video was taking shape. Do you take Apple Pay? He didn't. But Nina had this crazy stuff called cash. And apparently you can exchange it for goods and services. She liked to keep some around for situations just like this. Tom had asked her if it was a good idea to carry bills with them while they were hiking. Nina had just pointed out that if someone wanted it, they could come and take it from her. Or cook for them, which was what their host did. Even at that late hour, he didn't seem upset to be streaming, steaming more vegetables, cooking more rice, roasting more seaweed. A half hour later, they were sitting in front of heaped bowls and Tom was arranging her chopsticks to frame the perfect shot for the thumbnail. The rice was a shock of white at the bottom of the deep black bowl, folded over a dame, cubes of rich green avocado, the aromatic warmth of toasted sesame and sprinkled liberally with that famous seaweed he'd mentioned. Nina poked around with her sticks. Not complaining, but I'm kind of surprised there's no salmon in this. We make do without. The fish doesn't belong to us. Say what? Just what I said. It's against the law to fish in these waters. It doesn't belong to us. And there you go. That was an excerpt of the story Scattered by S.O. Green from Death Cuisine. OK, so thanks, Simone. And uh, we'll move on to our next guest. For our next guest, we are going across the pond. We are going to see Rebecca Rowland, who unfortunately, due to time, you know, time differences and all that kind of business, uh, we couldn't actually find a time to get together and do this. But she was cool enough to put together a video. I sent her some questions and she's put together a video answering those questions and delivering her excerpt. So enjoy. Hi. I'm Rebecca Rowland. I am an American writer. I'm originally from New England, Massachusetts in particular, and I'm the author of The Ice Storm, which appears in Death Cuisine. Um, I've been writing since I could pick up a pen. I remember my first published work was a poem titled Balloons, and it was published in my elementary, my primary school newspaper. And I couldn't tell you what it was about. I just remember being really proud that I spelled balloons correctly. When Tim first approached me about this project, about being a part of this project, I was honored. I, I really can't explain it any other way. Um, 
Tim and I had been in projects before. We had been in anthologies before together. And I knew of his work. Um, he was so prolific in his writing and um, his promotion. And you just see him everywhere. And so I thought, wow, this is a huge honor for him to think of me um, to join these other writers um, in Deaf Cuisine. And as soon as I saw the lineup, I thought, whoa, um, this, is, this is super cool. Uh, what came first, the story or the recipe? The story for sure. So I had the idea, I had the bones of the ice storm written down. In fact, I had the first couple of paragraphs and then sort of the skeleton done. But then I just, I just lost my drive and I set it aside. It was a story that I had wanted to write for many years, actually. And I just didn't have a catalyst to really push me to finish it. And as soon as um, Tim mentioned this particular project, I thought, this is it. This, this is what the story is meant for. And it just took off from there. Um, it ended up really writing itself to the point where I had to go back and chop a bunch off because it had gotten a little too long. Um, do I cook? Yes, I do cook. Um, I've been a vegetarian for most of my life, I would say for most years, since I was about 18 or 19 years old. And it's just my spouse and I in our home and we work opposite shifts. So we really only share meals maybe twice a week. And that's my opportunity to make um, something more complicated or something that's a more a larger meal. Otherwise, unfortunately, I'm just sort of making small things for myself. I'm not a big fan of going out to eat. I'm, I'll do takeout or takeaway um, sometimes, but for the most part, I am a homebody and I'll just make um, whatever I have in the house. Um, my favorite thing to cook is probably shakshuka. I love it. I could probably eat it every day of my life um, if my spouse didn't murder me <laughs> for making it too often. And um, I would have loved to have worked that into deaf cuisine, but it just didn't jive with the storyline. I couldn't figure out a way to put shakshuka um, traveling so, um, because in the ice storm, it's six strangers that come together when they are stranded because of a weather emergency. And one of them happens to be carrying a dish that he was bringing to a family event. And that's the dish that appears in Death Cuisine. I ended up choosing bread pudding, which I know is very pedestrian, um, especially in, in the UK. I know it's something, it's just an everyday dish. Um, but it's significant for me because it's something that my father absolutely loves to make. He makes it for himself on a regular basis, and he happened to have brought over um, a dish of it um, because he was so excited about, about the bread pudding that he had made that I thought, well, this, this is it. This is the dish that's, that's, that can be transported and, and brought to, to places and brought to gatherings so it works um, also, just for the plot, I think it works as well as far as um, how the characters interact with it. I thought it worked really well. I'm not a big fan of desserts. I, I, I don't really like sweet things. I'm much more of a, a spicy or a savory fan, but I could definitely get behind the rum sauce. How hard did I find the concept? I didn't find it difficult at all. I think the only thing that was difficult for me is um, just my own self-doubt, knowing that um, Tim had invited me and looking at the other writers that were part of this project. I, I, think, I think every writer does this. You know, we sort of think, oh gosh, you know, I, I can't, there's no way I'm gonna hold up against these, these other authors. And I do think looking at the other stories in the collection that mine is definitely is, is at sort of the bottom of the list in comparison to some of the absolutely fantastic horror stories 
um, that the other authors came up with, but just the fact that my little story is kind of in there and amongst them, I think um, makes me feel really good. What am I working on now? Um, right now, I am working on promotion for an anthology that I curated that drops in January. It's called Generation X, and it's a collection of um, horror stories written specifically by writers of Generation X featuring elements from Generation X. I'm really excited about it. It's writers from, from Europe, from the United States, Australia, um, all types of horror. And so I'm, I'm nervous and I'm excited and I can't wait to see it in print. So right now that's what I'm doing is just working out a promotional plan and, and getting everything prepared for that. Okay, excerpt time. This is from The Ice Storm. Turn it up, instructed Douglas, and Todd, after looking around for a remote without luck, balanced on his toes to reach the volume button. The sound screamed to life, jarring the relative silence. Initially attributed to a faulty space heater, but officials state that preliminary tests show no unusual carbon monoxide levels in the home. The screen changed to a wide shot of a team of coroner's office workers carting two stretchers with long black body bags out of a white shingled home's front door. On the edge of the frame, a large German shepherd sat patiently, panting in front of an ice-covered evergreen bush. A parent visitor, as of yet unidentified, is wanted for questioning regarding the... Lucas slammed his glass down on the bar top. Smart murderer, suffocate your family during a weather emergency. No one the wiser. He laughed and lifted the glass to signal for a refill. As he did, the camera panned onto the dog. The side of the animal's head was splashed with a reddish brown substance, nearly black. Looks like the dog didn't go hungry, quipped Tina. That's not blood, protested Wayne. Besides, it's on the side of his head. If he was eating dead people, it would be all over his mouth. James pressed his lips together. I'm not sure I like where this conversation is going. I think that's a crime scene dog, said Douglas. No, if it were a police dog, it would have the collar. You know, the coat thing with the insignia on the side, said Wayne. You think the crime scene dog was chewing on the evidence? Smart killer, disguise your work, cover your tracks. You're not listening, I said. Shut up, all of you, yelled Tina. I'm trying to hear. As she said this, the screen dissolved into a scene of a pigtailed girl cleaning her room. Nancy Sinatra's These Boots Were Made For Walking chimed in the background. A fast food burger chain commercial. Change the channel, Tina commanded the bartender. It's probably on one of the other stations. Piqued your interest, did it? Said James. You one of those true crime junkies? Tina kept her eyes on the screen as Todd stretched again to hit the buttons. I think, wait, wait, there, back one. Todd did as she instructed, and another local news reporter's voice called out to them from the speakers. The same shot from a slightly different angle of the white shingled house ejecting its plastic wrapped residence ran as a male voiceover narrated. Officials have ruled the deaths of the four family members suspicious and are asking for help from anyone with information about this brutal tragedy who, Douglas snorted, brutal tragedy, seems like a bit of editorial hysteria, don't you think? I mean, if the family died of CO poisoning. New said the police originally thought that, but, but something apparently changed their minds, said Tina. But brutal? I mean, if you're going to die, it seems like CO2 is the best way, yeah? You just fall asleep, right? My dad killed himself in the car in the garage, Lucas announced suddenly, too loud. 
Everyone turned to look at him. N not when I was a boy, but m much later, when I was in my 20s. He stared up at the television screen. My mom died years earlier, and I, I moved into my own place before that. Dropped in to say hello one Saturday and found him. Tina put her hand over her mouth. Oh, God, I, I, Lucas continued as if he hadn't heard. Doctor said later he probably was there for almost a week. Skin was bright pink, like a raspberry it was, but stripes of flesh color here and there, maybe where the skin was folded over. His mouth, he touched his index finger to the space above his top lip. Under his nose was black, like soot. This bloody spit dried on his skin, crusty. He removed his finger and looked down at his drink. The smell, I never forgot the smell. Tina drew an audible breath in, looked back at the screen and covered her mouth again. I knew it, she said. That house is right down the street from here. I knew it looked familiar. The screen's image changed to one with a dark-skinned, handsome man behind a news desk. Again, we want to repeat, anyone with information about this incident is asked to call the Sheriff's Department immediately at the number at the bottom of the screen. Wayne removed his cell phone from his front pocket and began poking at the screen. Thanks for inviting me, Tim. I had a great time making this story. Right, yeah, for our next guest, we're gonna to go to the other side of the planet. We're going to Australia uh, to meet Jasmine Jarvis. Now, again, Jasmine couldn't make it. Um, you know, life gets in the way and all that kind of business. So like I did with Simone, I'm going to do the same thing with Jasmine, basically. So she had the same questions, and I'm going to read an excerpt to the end. Okay. Yeah, so my first question was, first, tell me a little bit about yourself. Who are you? Where are you from? How long have you been writing? Et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Jasmine replied, I'm an Aussie, currently living in Brisbane, Queensland. Been about a month's time, my family and I are packing up and moving further north. I love to travel and I'm obsessed with wombats. I love wombats. They're awesome. It's what, I've never actually seen one. Uh, in zoos over here, you tend to get wallabies, kangaroos, that kind of business, but you never get wombats. And I love the little things. Well, they're not that little, are they? But uh, quokkas as well. I want to meet a quokka at some point. When I'm not writing, I'm at my day job working in admin, studying an arts degree at uni and juggling family demands and schedules. <coughs> my next question was, when I first approached you about the project, what were your thoughts? Uh, Jasmine replied, hell yes, this is a fantastic idea. That's what I like to hear. <laughs> okay, uh, my next question was, what came first, the story or the recipe? Uh, Jasmine's response was, the recipe. My 12-year-old son, Mish, picked out the recipe and I created my story around it. And of course, my son, Mish, ended up being included in the story. Quite right so. Quite right so. Yeah, so my next question was, uh, do you cook? If so, what's your favourite type of thing to cook? If not, who does the cooking? Blah, blah, blah. Uh, her response was, I do, do cook. I'm the daughter of an army cook, so I joke that I could cook for a battalion. I'm more into cooking savoury over sweet dishes, although my family love my raspberry jam and coconut slice, and my butterscotch bread and butter pudding. Yeah, I'm not a dessert chef. I, <laughs> I've been a chef all my life, but um, I'm not a dessert chef. I can do them, but I, it's not my forte. Uh, yeah, my next question was, how hard did you find the concept? Did it flow from the pen, or were you racking your brains trying to come up with a dish to work a story around? Uh, Jasmine's response was, once Mish and I had settled on the dish, the story pretty much told itself to me. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, it's a really, got a really good atmosphere to it. It's like uh, I tend to like it's got because it's because it's obviously got the Egyptian sort of feel to it. So I, I tend, you know, you can almost hear the oud music 
you know, and I'm, to I'm talking about the, the traditional Arabic loot, not this fella. Um, yeah, my next question was, why did you choose your particular dish? Uh, and the response was, Mish thought it would be different. It's also a very tasty dip. And since right in Second Death, it has become a favourite dish with the family. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm hoping people will try these at home. Because that is a really, I, I'm a fan of that myself, that dip. It's a good dip. Uh, finally, what are you working on right now? Uh, Jasmine's answer was, starting to draft my essay plan for my current uni subject. Witch hunting. 1400 to 1700. Awesome. Uh, I signed up to NaNoWriMo this year, this month, to get me back into running revisions of a manuscript I'd written back in 20, 2019 and tidying up a few short stories for submission. Excellent. It sounds like you're uh, quite busy. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, so uh, thank you for that, Jasmine. And uh, now I will do read an excerpt of her story, Second Death. The CT scan was set up and ready for the patient. The team of museum creators, directed by Hamish, moved the gurney alongside the padded slab of the CT table. The mummy was gently lifted across from the gurney to the table, using the sheet to hoist its featherweight form, careful not to touch the body for fear of contamination. The team stood back now to discuss with the radiographer what was to take place. Hamish remained by the mummy to get a proper look at it under the fluorescent clinical lights. The bandages were intact, but the corpse had obviously shrunk and withered. Poking out from the bandages that were wrapped around the right hand was the tip of the mummy's forefinger. The skin was blackish green, and the bone protruded slightly out above the gnarled fingernail. He leaned down to get a better look at it, for he thought he saw the fingertip twitch. Surely a trick of the light? No, it had moved ever so slightly. Hamish blinked once, twice, and a third time for good measure. The finger was still slightly twitching. Looking at the others in the room to see that they were preoccupied with starting the scan, Hamish reached out and touched the mummy's finger. Mr Jarvis, we're ready now to start the CT. I'm going to need you and the others to come in and wait in the room behind us. Hamish startled and pulled his hand back quickly, looking at the radiographer who motioned to him with his clipboard to go in the small room with the large glass windows, lit up by the soft glow of computer screens. Uh, of course, yes, Hamish stammered, looking down at the mummy to find the twitchy finger was now detached from his hand and laying on the bed next to the mummy. In a lapse of poor judgment, Hamish quickly snatched up the digit and put it in his shirt pocket, telling himself that it could fall off and get lost inside the scanner and he would reunite the mummy with its digit once it was safely back inside its sarcophagus. He retreated to the small room to watch with the others as the mummified corpse slowly entered the scanner. He soon forgot about the finger in his shirt pocket. It had been a long day when Hamish walked into his apartment. Kicking his shoes off, he dropped the keys on the side table and headed down the hall towards the living room. He slung his jacket over the back of one of the dining chairs and stopped by the sink to grab a glass of water. The CT scans were real. The mummy was beautifully preserved, but despite this, they were still no closer to working out the mummy's identity. The abdominal cavity was filled with lots of sharp teeth, teeth from Nile crocodiles. The face, despite its leathered skin, was serene, almost looking like it was smiling. Hamish thought to himself. Taking a swig of water, he then remembered the finger in his shirt pocket. He forgot to slip it back into the sarcophagus before they sealed the mummy back in. Crap. Taking out the finger, he examined it. Blackened. The skin all leathery. The finger was slightly curled. The tip of the bone had pierced the skin. How on earth could he have thought that this rotting old finger had, been mo had moved back then in the CT room? It was a trick of the lights in the room, perhaps. Now he was standing at his kitchen sink, holding an incredibly old forefinger from the right hand of an unknown mummy. Bite it! The thought flashed into his mind from nowhere. Rotating the digit around, something within him was urging him to bite it. No! Ugh. Hamish, repulsed for entertaining such a thought, set the finger down on the kitchen bench and backed away from it. It had been a long and exciting day for him, and now he was tired. Maybe it would be best for a quick dinner, shower, and an early night. 
he would work out how he was going to return the finger to his owner in the morning. He moved the finger from the kitchen bench to the empty fruit bowl on the edge of the bench and then set about fixing himself some dinner. In the fruit bowl, the tip of the finger twitched. The protruding bone scratched at the base of the bowl before the finger extended out, stretching after thousands of years bound in place. It felt so good to be free again. After dinner, Hamish dropped his dishes into the sink and went off to have a shower. Washed, ready for bed, he stopped by the sink to get himself another glass of water. He glanced into the fruit bowl, the glass slipping from his hand and shattering in the sink. The finger was plump. The finger was now not black and leathery. It was mottled. Patches of fresh flesh appearing before his eyes. Oh, how is this possible? He rubbed at his eyes, but it was no use. The finger was filling out and moving more and more now, trying to drag itself from out of the bowl. Hamish moved quickly, snatching up a pair of tongs from the second drawer and grabbing the empty plastic food container that had once held the leftover fried rice that he had reheated for his dinner. As the tongs gently grasped the wriggly finger, Hamish heaved. A little bit of goo dribbled out the end of the finger that had been attached to its owner's hand. The finger made a soft plop as it landed on the dregs of oil and rice. The sound of the lid clicking in place seemed to make Hamish feel a little bit better. Holding the container up so he could look at the finger, he struggled to process what it was doing. By now, most of the decay had gone, and the finger was nice and plump. The bone protruding from its tip was no longer visible. Flesh now covered it. His fingertip tapped about, dragging itself around and stopping to dip into a small slick of oil as if it were tasting it. No, imagination was getting the better of him. It was time for bed. Convinced there was no way the finger was going to go anywhere, he set the container on a shelf in the fridge and headed for bed. The finger tip tapped about until it brushed against the grain of fried rice. Quivering in excitement, the tip of the finger pressed down upon the grain, a small mouth appearing, filled with rows of tiny sharp teeth. It devoured the grain of rice, its first meal in what had been an eternity. The finger pulsated, digesting. More. It needed more. A change was coming. Excellent. Yeah, and that, that's an excerpt of Second Death by Jasmine Jarvis. Excellent. Yes, so thank you for that, Jasmine, and thank you for taking part in that. Uh, and let's move on to our next guest. Right, yes, we're going over the pond now to my next guest, Mr. Drew Starling. <laughs> you gotta love it. You gotta love it. You know, I bought this for $70, and so my philosophy is I'm gonna get every fucking penny I can out of it. You've been in the shop today, yeah. Yeah, dude. So, and it is the best quality. It's a high quality mask. You've got really kind of realistic, uh, you know, that is really, that is a, I thought when it, when you showed it me earlier, it was like, that's a really good mask. It it's is like a good mask. So, anyway, latex, not that horrible plasticky shite you get usually. My wife doesn't like it when I come home from work wearing it. <laughs> Maybe that's no accounting for taste, is there? <laughs> Oh, cool. man, how you doing? I'm good, man. Yeah, I'm good. And yourself? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, yeah, dude, things are things are busy. Um, mm. I haven't been able to write as much because life has just gotten in the way. But um, yeah, I I guess I took a break from writing, writing, and was so focused on marketing for Sentinel for like months that I've finally That's gotten kind of what I'm in at the minute. I'm in that sort of marketing phase, exactly. which I'm just all day. All I seem to be doing is bloody yeah. promoting something. I haven't had time, I haven't had time or week to get any proper writing done. And it's, it's, you've got to constantly remind yourself, this is writing too. This is the yes. same. Yeah. They both have to happen. Yeah. So we've switched roles now that I'm, I'm like going into a hermit phase and I'm writing this thing and you're marketing. Your yeah. Song. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be going into the hermit phase in December. Good. <laughs> That's I it. Like, like December, that. I'm turning the internet off. I'm just gonna. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect, man. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Congratulations on Sentinel. It's doing really well. Thank I you. Just... Yeah. 
I saw I, it in a listing for an award the other week. Uh, yeah, it was. It is. A, it is on the list of recommended works for uh -huh. the H for the Horror Writers Association first novel, which do, very means very little at this point. Yes. Um, just it's so that, cool, I, isn't it? It yeah. is cool. No, it's super cool. I mean, I I I've mentioned this to you and others before. Like, I had no idea what to expect in releasing this, and yeah. um, it, like I just mentioned to you too, I kind of leave it on a little bit of a cliffhanger um, and wasn't even planning to write a second one because I didn't really think it was going to go anywhere or do anything. And now I'm scrambling to write the second one because people are, that's the biggest complaint is people are like, what's what? So, uh, I, you know, uh, so that, that's a little bit of a lesson learned is like, if you're, well, either just don't let them a cliffhanger. That's one thing you could do, or yes. have yeah. plans to immediately write the second one because uh, <laughs> I'm now scrambling to write the second one, um, as Michelle will tell you. But uh, but well, other than that, it's been great. So it's been a really no, wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. No, no, I'm glad. I'm glad it went well because I read it before, uh, before the editing phase. I read it during. Oh yeah, the phase. that's right. Yeah, and I, I really enjoyed it. So I'm glad it's doing well for you because it's a bloody good book. So uh, yeah. Yeah, I really liked it. I love the atmosphere of it and everything like that. It's really cool. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. 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 So, yeah, Death Cuisine. What were your first thoughts when I approached you about it? Well, my first thought was, I don't know shit about cooking. <laughs> <laughs> and I, know I was going to ask you this. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know. And, again, don't tell my wife this either, but, uh, you know, I was like, well, you probably don't want to ask me for cooking advice or, you know, do you want me to do my, my best ramen noodle dish? I can make really good spaghetti and sauce. <laughs> and maybe I could have done that. But, um, you know, uh, besides that, I, I, what, what was nice about your anthology and, and, and the other one that we did too together, yeah. um, the Jack the Ripper stuff was, yes. yeah. you gave me a very focused, you know, I like having a clear focus. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I do myself. That's why I tend to do it when I, I, so I tend to like a good brief that I can sort of, because my I'm quite scatty, so I tend to forget things as I'm going along and go, oh, exactly. well, if I can go back and look at a document. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And I was thinking I really had fun writing that Annie Chapman bit. And um, <laughs> you know, that was that was an experience where it was all just one novel, which, which was mm. kind of, a, which was really, I don't know how you pulled that off. I wouldn't sign up for anything like that. How are you? But. <laughs> Apparently <laughs> you're a masochist. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, I, I, I love it. I, yeah. Well, I was about baby that one. Uh, so. uh, yeah, that was a fun one to write for sure. I really just kind of, and with this one too, I kind of maybe maybe it isn't clear, but I, I kind of just it it was just uh, uh it, with that one I really kind of just took the shackles off of myself and um with this one a little bit too like when I'm writing Sentinel or like now that I'm writing the the follow-up, I have all these rules in my head. Like, I got to yeah. stick to this style and do this. But, you know, I really enjoyed yours because it, it, I took it at least as an opportunity to kind of just forget about that and take the barriers down. And so that was a lot of fun, and it's fun to do that. Yes, definitely. Yeah, so, so I assume that the, uh, the story came first because you're not, the co not a cook. Yeah. Well, actually, I had an idea for a different story, and okay. I just wasn't – it just wasn't happening. Um, oh, I think you spoke to me about it. It was a very good, good, good concept. But when you said it, I was like, yeah. "How are you going to make that work?" <laughs> I, well, yeah, and I just, I, I, I just didn't feel myself enjoying it. Mm. Um, um, I didn't. I couldn't figure out the ending, and that's always critical. Yes. And so what I ended up doing is uh, Adam Neville, who I'm sure you're familiar with, great yes, am, yeah. writer. Um, he has a this collection called, I think it's, I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's called Weird and Other Derelictions or Word. Ah, yes. Yeah, w Weird. I just call it Weird. Yeah. It's a great weird. collection. Great. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great collection. And, and, you know, like your collection that all follows the theme of these sort of Lovecrafty. And so, yes. you know, what you're getting, he wrote this collection that I read recently, well, maybe a couple of years ago now that all followed a certain theme and a writing style. And I thought to myself, well, you know what? I want to try doing that. Uh -huh. And so that's essentially what I tried to do was a Adam Neville weird style um, nice. story. 
And that's what I, that's what I ended up doing. And that really was a fun exercise for me. I'd love to try it again because it got me out of thinking about writing a linear story in terms of timeline and yes, really thinking about trying to have a linear story in terms of following an object or a thing. Um, yes. and, and that's, that was fun for me to do. And it was easier to kind of map it out. Like, well, if I know where we're starting and I know where we're ending. Yeah, I can it's just like, well, it starts here, it starts here and it goes to this guy and then to that guy. Yeah. I thought yeah. you did a great job on it. It's uh, it really, was it was an interesting, because I wanted to say it was a very interesting style. Um, exactly. Well, that's, yeah. I got to give Adam Neville his due there because that, it was motivated strongly by that. Like, yeah. I'm going to try it, I take an object and start and go and follow this one little thing. And that was fun to do. Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so who is the cook in the house then? The cook? Oh, well, Jesus. Um, <laughs> or do you just live on takeaways and eat yeah, it out? Well, <laughs> She's absolutely the cook, um, yeah. but I think it's 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 one of those things where we both it it's not always a natural like some people just love it, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and there are things like uh, actually what I was going to do was Hello Fresh, which do, do, I'm sure you all have this. That's what I my yeah we've got the adverts all the time over here. Yeah. Right? These boxes that turn up at your door with all the ingredients. Exactly. Uh, which, was my original concept and yes I, I remember yeah for whatever reason just couldn't i mean but that's a horror story right there a box of food ingredients shows up in your door anyway um yes but you know she she cooked uh, an amazing spaghetti and kind of new type of meat sauce last night that we had uh along with some steamed broccoli and some other stuff yes. um but again we just got back from well we got back from a holiday for about a week, and so none of us have cooked a thing in a week, and so it's like hard to <laughs> get back at it. So anyway, yeah. um, I guess she's the cook, if that, if anybody is. Yeah, yeah, excellent. <laughs> right, so yeah, are you going to read us a little bit of a, an excerpt of your story? Yeah, I'll just start here at the beginning. Yep. And um, what do you think? Do you think we should go with the glasses or the mask? <laughs> go with a mask, man. Why not? <laughs> I'll make it really, really creepy. Cool. I'll, I'll, I'll leave you to it. Give me a wave when you're done. <laughs> All right. Go ahead. Go on. Drip, drip, drip. Drops slowly fill the steel sink basin in the kitchen of the Hotel Monaco. The weight of the water presses hard against the trap of arugula blanketed over its drain. Leaves bending firmly around the drain's cylindrical contours, but not breaking. The leaves are strong because the Hotel Monaco only orders the finest arugula, and they always, always serve the same day. But the Hotel Monaco will not be serving arugula tomorrow. They won't be serving anything. Drip, drip, drip. The hours drag as the basin fills. The water rises, tranquil save for the bobbing of bloated grains and risotto stifled over its surface. The water inches from the tip of the U-shaped tap and mere millimeters from the curved bevel of the sink's edge. The arugula holds firm, the leaves united in their defense. Plop, plop, plop. The first drops land squarely on the underside of the gold wedding band bulging from the flesh of Martin Schlosser's dead rig finger. Martin had been manning the sink at the Hotel Monaco just as he had been each Saturday except for one two-week vacation for the last 14 years. It wasn't glamorous work, as Martin would be the first to admit it, but it was steady and it paid well. Everyone at the Hotel Monaco was paid well because the Hotel Monaco always had money, even in the off-season. Plap, plap, plap. Tap water runs down his finger and pools in the palm, eventually spilling onto the linoleum floor and mixing with another liquid already soaking his white Hotel Monaco Monaco uniform, his blood. Martin's other dead hand still hopelessly clutches the gaping gash in his stomach, an awkwardly ripped fissure running the entire width of his waist. The tap water is no longer itself. It's red. It's somehow more alive than it was before, and it's spreading its tentacles throughout the kitchen towards three other pools of blood, three other dead bodies. It first reaches Jessica Hopwell, the line cook fresh out of culinary school 
bursting with pride at the beginning of her rags riches tale, but now dead. The only part of Jessica that was bursting tonight was her stomach, from the inside, and now she lay face down in a pool of blood. Rodrigo Domingo, the busboy, lay face down because he fell to his knees first. Kneeling next to a still-standing head chef, Janet Tresh, he wrapped his hands over his waist, and when he felt something bulging, squirming, writhing in his stomach with such force his fingers could trace it, he knew he was going to die. Janet took the necessary deep inhale to unleash a scream loud enough to rip through glass, but the muscles in her diaphragm exploded in pain before she could release it. By the grace of God, or Satan, or some other entity, or absolutely nothing at all, Janet passed out from the excruciating pain before she even knew what was happening. It was the smack of her skull against the marble countertop that killed her before her stomach, too, burst open. She now lay next to Rodrigo in a puddle of pooling blood in the dull silence of the kitchen. Gush, gush, gush. The silence evaporates as tap water laps over the sink's edge and spills onto the floor, into the growing puddle that's already there, injecting it with the power it needs to jump to the threshold of the boxy bat wing doors that lead to the ballroom. One of those two doors is held open by the corpse of Jeremy Grimm, manager of the Hotel Monaco, a portly, balding man stuffed into a silk three-piece who just about wished for death to find him as he barged into the kitchen to man, what the hell did you put in the food? Blood water now flows past his lifeless body, gently blowing past the scraps of flesh still hanging from his open stomach. Because of the angle at which Jeremy fell, his intestines have also spilled out of his stomach. There are hardly a deterrent as the water creeps forward. Seep, seep, seep. The ballroom's beige wall-to-wall -wall carpet sucks up the blood water, as if the nylon fibers themselves are somehow thirsty, but the water is too much and flows on. It basks at the sheer size of the room, the height of the ceilings, the elegance of the wall sconces, the immediately, the, the immaculately, ornate tablecloths draped over all three dozen tables, and the hundreds of bodies lying in various states of suspended panic, which if, which if the blood water has its way, and it will, will turn red too. Superb, the generous... right? Brilliant. <laughs> yeah, well done. Yeah, <clears throat> I thought the mask added a nice bit of creepiness to that. Yeah. <laughs> Did you hear me through it? I was worried about Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. I could hear you. I hear you fine. Yeah. Just uh, may, I'll maybe tre tweak the treble a little bit. But apart from that, it was all fine and dandy. Yeah. So that was the beginning. Yeah. yeah. And it just gets worse. From yes. There. There's some brilliant lines in that. <laughs> it's just, yeah, yeah, it was fun. Yeah, yeah. I, lo I love the bit. About, I always, I, that bit about the manager, I don't know why. It just makes me laugh. It made me laugh when, when I first yeah. read it. I don't know why. It's just like, when he said, what the hell did you put in the food? <laughs> There's definitely a little comedy. So he is based off a real life person in my head. <laughs> nice. And it's always such a nice, when you have such a clear picture of someone. Yes. It's yeah. easier to just <clears throat> them. Yeah. yeah. Well, as somebody who spent all his life working in kitchens, I know several people. Who oh. that fits? <laughs> it's the stereotype, isn't it? <laughs> it's the stereotype. exactly all stereotypes. Yeah, yeah, and uh, that is uh, to me that's like I've worked with that guy several times. <laughs> exactly. I think they're coming here to arrest me now for wearing this mask literally all over town. Yeah, so I heard I'm that. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Cool. Right. Well, nice one, man. Thank you for joining us. My and, pleasure. Uh, yeah, you take it easy, mate. I will speak. I will speak to you again soon. Wave goodbye right. to you. <laughs> Later, buddy. Thanks for having Later, me. Later, man. Bye. And there you go. That was the wonderful Drew Starling, and that is the end of our video. Thank you all for watching. Uh, below, you will find information about how to get hold of a copy of Death Cuisine. There will also be links to the live party with the other guests. Uh, and some various other bits of Bob's, like the book trailer and all that kind of stuff. And the reading that I did of Callum Pierce's story, Lunch Break. Uh, thank you all for watching. And uh, I hope you join me next time. I've got some kind of random video madness to unleash upon the world. Uh, so hit like, subscribe and the little notification bell. And uh, yes, I will see you all soon.
Now, there will be a live launch, which has probably already happened, so that was a silly thing to say. Cut. <laughs> ah. When I'm writing... Hold on one minute. You seem to have... You're frozen on my end. Oh, no. Am I? Shoot. Yeah. Well, the next question I ask is, do you cock... <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <coughs> there. And I will then hunt around like an idiot for the stop button because they keep. There we go. Am I back? Nope. Am I back? Nope. Uh... Chirashi. Chirashi. Fuck. First time she came on, I was like, Bruh, it's talking at me. Stop it. Fuck. <laughs> Hold on. Oh, Matron. Oh, God. Slap your internet provider. <laughs> oh, you're back now. Wonderful title for this really good atmosphere. It's like I, I tend to hear, like, sit up. I don't need to. Okay. Yeah. All right. If that happens again, I'm gonna to switch to my hotspot because this is un unbearable. Right. <laughs> okay. Sensible. Come on, come on. Cook. I'm the daughter of an army. Move, 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 move.